What's up, guys? Welcome to the first episode of the Guard Post Podcast. I'm super excited to have you with me. We've got a lot of great content for you today, starting with positional breakdowns and ending with interviews. Super excited to have you on once again. Cue the intro. This is your host, Zachary Garden, and this is the Guard Post. <laughs> All right, before I get into any positional breakdowns, I'm going to start with how this episode is going to be formatted and how the episodes in the future are going to be formatted. They'll be formatted in segments or shifts. So this first shift will be wide receiver breakdowns. The second shift will be our interview with Gavin Hayes. The third shift will be safety breakdowns. The fourth shift will be cornerback breakdowns. And the fifth shift will be our interview with Ranthony Tejada. I'm super excited for all this. So we're going to go ahead and get started with our wide receiver breakdowns right now. So first, before we get started about what these wide receivers are, what this wide wide receiver group is, I'm going to start with what I look for when I look at wide receivers, and the first thing is going to be press release. I want to see how their feet are, how their hand fight, how they get off of a press, because that's one of the most important parts of being an elite receiver, and that's one of the first things I look for. The next thing is route running. I want to see how well a guy runs route, how crisp and fast he is out of breaks, how quickly he cuts off a route or comes out of a break, how he uses leverage to fool a defender into thinking he's going one way, but then he goes the next. Those are huge parts, and both those are huge in beating man coverage. Those are the first thing I look for in a receiver. If he can beat man coverage, he has a possibility of being a very good receiver. The next thing I look for, of course, is hands. You have to be able to catch the ball as a receiver. You're getting, th- you're getting the ball thrown to you. It's one of the most important things. So if you can't catch the ball consistency, that's a knock in my book, and I get a little bit worried. So now I'm just going to go ahead and get into these receivers and who I like and what I think of each one. We're going to talk about all 10 of them, I believe there are. Some of them will be shorter than others, but we're going to go ahead and get started. The first one's going to be Demarcus Ayers. He's going to wear number one for the Guardians. He's from Houston. He's 25 years old. He's 5'9", 185 pounds, a little bit on the shorter side. His college stats, he played in 40 games, had 141 receptions, had 1,686 yards receiving, nine touchdowns, and 12 yards per reception. He also played for Pittsburgh for a couple of games in the NFL. He played in two games, had 13 targets, six receptions, 53 yards receiving, and one touchdown. So he had a decent little bit of production in the NFL. He had his cup of tea, which is good. It's nice to see a guy with NFL production on this roster. So some of the things I like about him, he's a shifty dude. He's really shifty. He makes people miss a lot. He's great in the open field, which is fantastic. He's got some punt return ability. He did that a lot at Houston. And he did some of that in the NFL, not as much, but he did some. And that's really good for a guy to be able to do multiple things. He's primarily a slot guy. That's where he spent most of his time. But one of my main knocks on him is he didn't have an expansive route tree at Houston. I don't know how many routes he ran when he was in Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh usually has a pretty developed passing game, which is good. At Houston, he ran mostly slants, screens, and goes. There was a lot of that. He didn't really have anything else he ran, which is a little worrying. When I watch him, he has the skills and shiftiness to be a great route runner. You see it on his press releases. You see it when he's making guys miss in the open field. He has this burst and quickness to be able to be a great route runner. If he's coached up on it, I think he could be really good there. He's got good hands too. He didn't drop a lot of passes. Made a couple highlight reel catches. And then he has good speed as well. He works primarily out of the slot, so he didn't get to see a lot of his press release, but I think he has the shiftiness to be good there as well. Overall, I think he's a guy that'll end up making this roster. I like him. I like what I saw from his film. So he's a guy I'm excited to watch. The next guy we're going to talk about is Tanner Gentry out of Wyoming. He's number 19. He's 25 years old. He's 6'2 and 200 pounds. He's got good size about him. He's probably one of the most productive receivers from college that we have on this roster. He had played in 42 games, had 180 receptions, 2,815 yards, 20 touchdowns. 15.6 15.6 yards per reception in his last two seasons he was 18 plus in his yards per reception which is really good in the NFL he had his cup of tea he played in four games had six targets three receptions for 35 yards didn't produce as much as Demarcus Ayers in the NFL but of course he was with Chicago it's a less pass heavy offense some of the things I like about him though he's got really good hands made a lot of highlight reel catches at Wyoming so that's always a good thing he's got plus body control he's a really good red zone guy I notice he runs pretty good routes in the red zone, gets open, makes plays on the ball. He's got decent speed. He's not the fastest guy. He's not the best yards after catch guy either, I noticed. He averaged like three yards after catch in college, which isn't great, but he was mostly a downfield receiver, so he didn't have to make a ton of yards after catch plays. He's not the fastest out of breaks, and his long stance can cause false steps, and it causes him to struggle against press. 
when you have to take an extra step, it's time wasted. Let's throw a cornerback get into you. You don't want that to happen as a wide receiver. So shortening up his stance will fix a lot of his problems. And I think a good coach can coach him up on that. Some of the things I really like about him, though, is he shows an understanding of leverage. I remember watching his film in one go route. He weaved in and out of the cornerback's blind spot, making this guy twist and turn until he was open. And then he ended up making a miraculous catch on a bad throw from Josh Allen. But that route was really good. Even though it was a simple go route, he showed le- understanding of leverage and weaved in and out of this guy's blind spot and made him super confused. And that's something I really like about him. And then just his body control is really good. When he's up in the air, he's got really good hands, like I said. And he's a pretty good route runner. He shows an understanding of those things, which is good. And I think his athleticism may be a little lacking, but he's got the skills to make this roster. And I really like him as a possible under-the-radar guy to be our third or fourth receiver on this roster, maybe even the number two guy. The next guy we're going to talk about is Jayshun Harris the second. He's going to be wearing number five for us. He's from Indiana. He's got a really inspiring story. During his time in college, he had three ACL injuries, one in 2014, 2016, and 2017, but he came back every time to play again. He's really fast. He ran a 4.37 after the three knee injuries. He's on the smaller side. He's 5'8 and 172 pounds, and he's 25 years old. His college stats, 30 games played, 58 receptions, 507 yards, four touchdowns, and 8.8 yards per catch. He was mainly a punt returner and kick returner in college, though. So he had 33 punt returns, 425 punt return yards, 12.9 yards per punt return, three punt return touchdowns. And then his kick return stats are 20 kick returns, 404 kick return yards, 20.2 yards per kick return. And this was all at Indiana. He didn't spend any time in the NFL, which is a little worrying. I can understand that because due to his injury concerns, but he's fast. That's what I like. He could be a really good special teams guy for us, our main punt returner. So he's got a lot of talent there. The only thing that worries me is injury history. I don't like that. And then he just has this one dimensionality that's not conductive to making a roster. When you're only valuable in one sense as a lower level guy, you're less likely to make a roster. Jason Harris would just end up being on a special teamer, and that's not conducive to making a roster. So I don't see him making the roster. I think he could surprise some people with the speed, and that's his number one trait. But I think his lack of size and lack of experience at receiver will end up hurting him. Next guy we're going to talk about is Tavon Jacobs. Couldn't find a number on him. He's from Maryland. He's 24, 25 years old. Couldn't find an exact age on him. He's 5'11 and 170 pounds. He's got decent height. He's a little bit smaller, though, in frame. He's got 36 games played in college. He had 93 receptions, 1,145 yards, 9 touchdowns, and 12.3 yards per reception. He also had a couple punt returns. I don't have those stats up, though. He spent his first preseason in Baltimore, and he got some praise from John Harbaugh. I can't remember which brother it is, but one of the Harbaugh brothers that coaches there, I'm pretty sure it's John. He got a lot of praise from him during the training camp, saying he was a good route runner. He ended up getting cut, but that's always promising when you're getting praise from a guy like John Harbaugh. Some of the things I like, he's a slot guy, he's shifty, he makes people miss very well. He's a pretty decent kick returner. He's got good speed, he's a decent route runner, he shows a decent ability against press. He's just a good all-around player. But he couldn't get consistent time at Maryland, and that bother, that bothers me a little bit. There's something about that that just sticks in my brain, like, hey, you were rotating at Maryland. Why weren't you getting more playing time? And then he just didn't have a lot of production, which is a little worrying. Decent all-around player. He has a chance to make this roster. He'll be battling for one of those last two spots, most likely. It'll be a tough battle for him, though, an uphill battle. Next guy we're going to talk about is Justice Liggins. He's going to wear number 17 for the Guardians. He played at Stephen F. Austin during his time, a smaller D1 AA. He's 24 years old. He's 6'1 and 210 pounds. He's got good size. In college, he played 36 games, only started 13 of them, had 102 receptions, 1,166 yards, eight touchdowns, and he only had two 100-yard gains. To put that in comparison to a guy like Tanner Gentry, who had seven 100-yard gains in his senior year. So that's a little bit worrying. He's a little lacking from a production standpoint. And then also just as a route runner, he had a very limited route tree at Stephen F. Austin. A lot of these guys had limited route trees out of coming out of college. But the good thing is this guy spent time at Indianapolis and was on San Diego's practice squads two years in a row. San Diego kind of has a history of developing good receivers. There's a possibility he's developed a lot during that time, but just his lack of route running experience and then the lack of production in college worries me a little bit. He's a great athlete though. And then he's also great at the catch point. He usually comes down with it just due to his size, athleticism, and physicality. He's also got really good yards up catch ability. He's a great yak guy. I think he'll be battling for that fifth or sixth spot on this roster. He's a pretty athletic guy, so that could push him onto the roster. We'll have to just wait and see till camp. The next guy I'm going to talk about is Mikhail McKay. He's going to wear number 82 for the Guardians. 
He's originally from Cincinnati. He's 26 years old, 6'4", and 210 pounds. His college stats are 45 games played, 108 receptions, 2,034 yards, 18.8 yards per reception, 19 touchdowns, and five 100-yard games. He's coming from a little bit less of a passing system, though Cincinnati didn't move to the spread until like a two, year or two ago. What I like about him, he's big, he's athletic, he's our tallest receiver, I believe, and he makes plays on the ball. He was called Big Play McKay during his time in Cincinnati and his time in San Antonio with the AAF. He was the number one receiver down there. He was a big play guy. He made a lot of plays downfield. He was go up and get them kind of guy. He's got good speed for his size. The only thing that worries me is his limited route tree like most of these guys, but I feel like he developed a lot of that at San Antonio and during his time in the NFL, which he spent in Dallas, Chicago, Denver, Indianapolis, Tennessee, and a practice squad in Jacksonville. He spent a lot of time with NFL coaches, meaning he could have developed his route tree more, which is promising. And I think he's a guy that ends up making the roster as one of the top two receivers on the team, just due to his size and athleticism. And I think Kevin Gilbride's going to really like his style of play. The next guy we're going to talk about is Octavius Miles. He's number 13. He's played for Alabama A&M. He didn't really have an age for him. I'm guessing it's probably around 25, like most of these guys. That's my kind of median age for this roster. His height is 5'10". He's 174 pounds. He's a little light. He's got decent height. He went to college at Alabama A&M. He's mostly a returner there. I couldn't really find any stats on him. And he doesn't have any NFL experience. He's a really good return man from his time at Alabama A&M. The competition is a little bit lesser there, but he was still a good return man. He's really fast, doesn't have great size, He doesn't have any production, which worries me as a wide receiver. And I just haven't seen enough of his route running to really think, oh, this guy's going to be a good route runner. I'd have to see more. I just don't know how good he is. He doesn't have a lot of experience at receiver, which worries me. And I don't know if he's going to make the roster. Once again, like a guy like Jay Shun Harris, he has this one dimensionality that I wouldn't want on my roster if I was building it. I like guys who are able to do multiple things and be useful in multiple ways to my team. And I think a guy like Octavius Miles would be one dimensional and wouldn't be able to really help on the offensive side of the ball. You'd have to be a guy like Devin Hester, who was just a fantastic return guy and would return 14 touchdowns in a season to be able to make the roster as a one dimensional kind of guy. We'll have to wait and see with him if he's developed any route running since he's left college. The next guy I want to talk about is Colby Pearson. He's originally from BYU. He wears number three. He's 24 years old, six feet tall, and 195 pounds. His college stats, he played in 30 games, had 76 receptions, 864 yards, and eight touchdowns. He spent time in the NFL with Green Bay on their practice squad in some of his preseason in Atlanta. He was, originally, he was eventually cut with an injury waiver in Atlanta. He's got average size. I don't know much else about him. I couldn't find a lot of film or really anything on him. So he's kind of a mystery in my mind. He's probably going to end up battling for that fifth or sixth spot. I know I've read an article saying he was underutilized at BYU since his stats are a little lower. We'll have to wait and see with him. Just his production, the lack of production worries me a little bit, but we'll just have to wait and see. The next guy is Dalton Ponchilia. I don't have a number for him. He was recently signed. He went to Western Kentucky, and before that, he went to a smaller school I can't recognize. He's 24 or 25, couldn't find an exact age. And he's 5'11 and 190 pounds. His college stats are a little underwhelming. He played in one game, had one reception for 15 yards during his time at Western Kentucky. Somehow he worked that into a mini camp with the Jags and then some time in the CFL with Montreal. He looks like he has decent speed from his CFL tape I saw. He's got decent hands. He's just a decent all-around player. He doesn't have really anything flashy to him, which worries me a little bit. I like to have a guy with a higher ceiling than this. But I think he could provide some consistency at a slot position as like kind of a bigger slot. He reminds me a bit of Tavon Jacobs, except I think Tavon Jacobs is a little bit better route runner. So we'll just have to wait and see with him. I don't think he ends up making the final roster just due to the fact that he's similar to a guy who I believe is better than him. Of course, I haven't seen a ton of this guy's tape. It was hard to find tape on him concerning he had very little um, college production. We'll just have to wait and see with him. Like I said, he was a recent signee. He could end up showing out in camp. Next guy I'm going to talk about is Teal Redding. He's from Bowling Green. He doesn't have a number yet. He's 25 years old. He's 6'1 and 180 pounds. He played in 38 games. He started 19 of them. Had 171 targets, 94 receptions, 14 touchdowns, 1,328 yards, and 14.1 yards per reception. He spent time in the NFL with Detroit and during their preseason. He was practice squad in Washington and practice squad in Green Bay. So some of the things I had again on him, he's not the biggest guy. 
weight wise he's a little skinny for being 6'1 which worries me a little bit he could get bullied hopefully he's bulked up maybe 10 to 15 pounds I'd like to see him around that 195 range but he's got really good body control and he's a plus at the catch point this guy made so many contested catches in college he made like a 10 minute highlight reel of just those he didn't have a really extensive route tree from what I saw he only ran basically goes slants and screens because that's what a lot of colleges do with their best player but he's got really good athleticism. He's, he's decent speed-wise, but when you're six one, you can use longer strides so you don't have to be the fastest guy. I think the one way he makes this roster is he wows at camp with contested catches. I mean, once you make three or four contested catches in a week, guys are like, oh, this guy might have something to him. They start working on his route running and different things like that. He's a guy I really like from that perspective. He's kind of my dark horse to make this roster as a recent signee. He just flashes on tape. He's got a really high ceiling. He reminds me of a Marvin Jones with less route running. So Marvin Jones is known for his contested catches. He's really underrated in the NFL. And he reminds me of that, T.O. Redding does. And I think he has the ability to have that kind of ceiling, maybe a little bit lower, just a little less athleticism than Marvin Jones. But he has a similar build, a similar athleticism to him. Next guy I'm going to talk about is Damon Sheehy Giuseppe. I'm going to call him DSG because it's a little bit easier to say. He's going to be wearing number 15 for the Guardians. He's from Phoenix Community College. Not a lot of competition at that level. He's 24 years old. He's 5'11". and He weighs around 180, 185 pounds, which is a decent size. He was mostly return man in college and the NFL. You know, everybody knows that story about him having to lie his way into a workout with the Browns before ending up on their roster. It's really inspirational, I believe. And he ended up returning that touchdown in preseason. I don't have a lot of college stats on him concerning he's from a community college. But he was the NCAA leader in kick return yards and touchdowns in 2016. So he looks like he's a really good returner. Lack of experience at receiver worries me. He just hasn't spent a lot of time there. When he was at his CC, I looked at the highlights really quick. They just gave him the ball in any way possible, whether he was running back, receiver, quarterback, just any way to get this guy the ball because he's fast. So that's one of his pluses too. He's extremely fast, but he just doesn't have a lot of experience at receiver. His route running may not be very good. I don't know about his hands, but he's a really interesting name to keep an eye on. I can see him making this roster just as a story and his ability as a kick returner and punt returner and his ceiling. Other than that, I'm not really sure what he brings, but DSG is a really interesting name to keep an eye on, and hopefully he ends up making this roster as a kick returner and punt returner. He's really talented there and could bring a really useful skill to this team being a Devin Hester type of guy because I think he has that kind of ceiling. Next guy I'm going to talk about is Andrew Verboys. He's going to wear number seven. He's originally from Delaware. He's 25 years old, 5'10", and 205 pounds. He's a stockier dude. Could not find any of his stats, which is a little worrying. Even on Delaware's website, they didn't have any stats. The football reference for college football, I couldn't find anything on him. He's not the biggest guy. He's a little stocky. He doesn't have a lot of production from what I can see. He has a little bit of punt return and kick return ability, I saw from some spring league tape. He looks like he has good footwork. I saw him get off the press a couple times, which looked really good. Some of those guys were lunging and not being very good corners, but I saw some flashes of pretty good footwork in his press release. He looked like he had decent route running, but I just don't know what else he brings. We'll have to see if he shows out in camp, but I don't know if he'll make the final roster just because I don't know what he brings to the team. He may end up being a reliable guy in the slot, which is why we might keep him, but I think there are other guys on this roster that can make an impact there. The next guy I want to talk about is number 11. He's from Purdue. He's our number one draft pick, D'Angelo Yancey. He's 25 years old, which surprised me. When you look at a picture of him, he looks a lot older. He's 6'2 and 220 pounds. He's got really good size. He's built. He's strong. His college stats, he played in 47 games, started 36 of them. He had 141 receptions, 2,344 yards, 20 touchdowns, and 9 100-yard games. He produced consistently throughout his entire career, which is a plus. When you produce from a freshman to a senior in college, that means you are a consistent guy. He was a fifth-round pick in the 2017 draft by Green Bay. He ended up on their practice squad and ended up on the New York Jets practice squad as well and spent some time in Tennessee during their preseason. Like I said, this guy's got great size. He's built. He's strong. He's got really good athleticism for his size, too. He ran a 4'5", 340 for being at 220 pounds, which is really good. His footwork looked really good. He looked really solid on his press releases, which surprised me when I watched his tape. Usually when guys are this big, they're not really great footwork-wise and quickness-wise, but I think he's actually a plus there. His route running has a question mark. I didn't see him run a lot of different routes at Purdue. He ran a lot of goes, a lot of screens, a lot of slants, like most of these college receivers do. 
and his hands were questions. He had some drops during his career, which was really bad. I remember watching, I believe it was a Wisconsin game. He had two pretty big drops, one for a touchdown and one for a first down, which worried me. And then I've read somewhere in a scouting report that he also had a bad case of drop throughout most of his career. But he's got really great yak ability. He just makes people, people don't want to tackle him. He pushes them off, stiff arms them, makes them miss. And then I think he could end up being a good route runner. He showed flashes of it during his time at Purdue. And he's also just a great deep threat with great body control. He's a guy I really like. When I first went into his film, I was like, I don't know about him. I don't know much about him. But when I watched it, he's going to be really good, guys. That's as simple as that. He's going to be an athletic, big, strong receiver, kind of like a Hakeem Nicks in this Calvin Gilbride offense. So I'm excited for him. And that's kind of the end of breaking down all these receivers. Now I'm just going to talk about who I think is going to make the roster and how many of them are going to. Most NFL rosters end up taking six or seven receivers. I think we'll end up taking around there as well. Some of my lock for this roster are Tanner Gentry, Mikhail McKay, D'Angelo Hansi, and Demarcus Ayers. I think they're all just too talented to not make the roster. And then there's the battle for the last two or three spots. It's going to be between, between Tavon Jacobs, T.O. Redding, DSG, Justice Liggins, and Pearson. Colby Pearson, the way I see that kind of butting out is we're going to, probably going to get a slot guy in Tavon Jacobs. I think Justice Liggins end up making the roster due to his athletic talent, and I think T.O. Redding does as, too, does as well. I know Kevin Gilbride likes his bigger receivers, and I think T.O. Redding has that ability to be a really good guy, and I think Tavon Jacobs slides into the slot as well. I could see DSG making it instead of guys like maybe Justice Liggins just due to his plus return ability. And then out of the race, guys, I don't see really having much of a chance of making the roster are Ponchilla, Verboys, Miles, and Harris. They're really one-dimensional or just average. And without a high ceiling or another facet to your game, I don't really see you making seeing you making the roster. I could see Miles or Harris end up pushing DSG out due to their return ability. If they return better than DSG, then DSG is going to be on the chopping block probably. But we'll just have to wait and see how training camp plays out. Super excited for that. Super excited for this position. Love it. I think we had a lot of good competition here, a lot of good size and athleticism. And now we're going to go ahead and go to break before we go into our interview with Gavin Hayes. What's up, guys? Welcome to the break. Here's where I plan to have a couple of trailers or teasers or me just showcasing a certain podcast that's about the XFL or football. If you're interested in doing this, feel free to send me any teasers or trailers that are 20 to 30 seconds for your podcast, and I'll go ahead and throw them in my breaks. Thank you guys so much. What's up, guys? I'm here with Gavin Hayes, a writer for the XFL Board. Uh, he's a fantastic resource. You can find his articles on XFLboard.com and other places as, long as, as well as Twitter and different things like that. How you doing, man? I'm doing great. Happy to be here. That's great. How was your holidays? It was great. Some good time off. Spent a lot of time with family, and I'm just finally happy to be back in the groove. Oh, yeah, I get that. I get that. So I know you're covering the Guardians, um, and when it comes to football, I'm just kind of curious. I want to help you tell your story a little bit. What's your experience around football and like sports journalism just in general? So when I started sports journalism, I was just a big fan of minor league baseball, and I went to a lot of minor league baseball games. And I started writing articles for a website called Amazing Prospects and on Instagram as well on my own site. That's kind of something that was just a passion project I did. but. Um, I eventually started writing for FanSource Network or no, FanSource Headquarters or something like that. They shut down. That's why I don't remember the name. They then yeah. switched to they then switched to Primetime Sports. And there I wrote about the Jets and the AFC East. I'm from upstate New York and I'm a Jets season oh. ticket holder. So, nice. yeah. And I started writing articles there on football and soon enough i saw the xfl coming around and i wasn't really enjoying things at prime time even though it's a great place to write at, i'd have recommended to yeah. anyone it's just there's a lot of people there and it just wasn't my situation that i you know i i felt comfortable in so i ended up switching and i went on to write for the xfl board which is a fantastic site and ever since i've been doing articles on uh, the guardians and i'll hopefully be reporting at some games for the guardians and my own personal experience with football, I've played up until, I think, eighth grade. And now I'm playing for my varsity team in Red Oak, New nice. York. 
Yeah, so I'm looking way. forward to a good season and uh, uh very excited. What position do you play? So I came to the year as a right guard, but it looks like I'll be center. Center? Mm-hmm. That's a tough position, man. I was uh <laughs> so I played football all the way up till sophomore year of college. I was at D three, so it's nothing super special, but I was playing safety, yeah. so a little more familiar with the defensive side of the ball, but offensive line is a tough position, man. It's one of the hardest in the game. Yeah, I mean, it, it takes a lot of commitment, but you learn to love it, and that's pretty impressive. Oh, yeah. I mean, Division three football is a full-time job when you really get down to it. Oh, yeah. So uh, Yeah, no, I had to yeah. stop due to injury, sadly, but uh, it was still – it was a blast when I was doing it, but it was tough. It's still – we don't put as yeah. much time as those D1 guys, but we still put on a lot of time, and we don't even get scholarships for it, so – yeah yeah no it, it's a lot of work it, it's something that going forward personally I'd, I'd really have to like sit down and think about but oh yeah it's that's it's not that's a decision you take lightly yeah oh, for yeah. sure all right so now we're going to get into like a little bit about the xfl here what what made you super excited about this team as a whole when it comes to just the guardians and the xfl what made you what made you super excited well i saw about it uh, you know, a few years back that I was coming back and that was interesting. I had seen the 30 for 30 on the old league. And as I started to do more research into it, I realized that this wasn't going to be like the old league and that this, this is going to be something that lasts and stays. And as someone who enjoys about writing, you know, about sports and just commentating on things in general, I decided to jump on the opportunity to write about the XFL. And especially in specific, the New York Guardians, the fact that they play at MetLife Stadium and mm-hmm. it, they've been doing a lot of great work for the tri-state area. Um, you see them, you know, every week they're they're doing something it's charitable. It's, you know, oh, yeah. you, you see you see that with all, you know, professional teams, but it really does make a greater impact when this is a newly established league with newly established players and they're just doing mm-hmm. everything they can to c- create an impact on uh, on the people on you know it it's it should create jobs it should create uh, a sense of community for a lot of people and it's just something oh, yeah. that in general I was really excited about oh yeah that totally makes sense i mean when i'm so i'm not from new york i'm actually from the i live in the portland area now so mm-hmm. it's kind of weird that I picked one across from the country. But when I was just <laughs> looking at teams and stuff, I noticed I looked at the roster. I looked at the um, uniforms. Those are the two things that kind of sold me. Love the yeah. the way the roster is constructed. And the uniforms are awesome. But yeah, then I just saw like cool. the presence they've had, like especially just the XFL in general, has had like in the community. I think it's a huge step up. And it's definitely shaping a different image of the league than what people mm. immediately assume when they hear, oh, For XFL sure. is going to be like in 2001. But seeing this, them helping the community, just being good people like I'm sure they are, is yeah, I mean, definitely helping I, the image of the league. I mean, no matter what impact the XFL has on football in general, I, that it's not even going to be as great as the impact they've made with you know some of these cities that they're in. And it, sure, it's greater than football, but it's more about – it's not necessarily about the fact that they're doing the charitable work. It's that they're creating this. It, they – and oh, I just commend I just commend anyone involved in it for that, just creating this oh, yeah. and getting this off the ground must have been extremely difficult. Oh, I bet, I bet. I mean, whew, it's just it's tough to think about. I'm just happy it's here now. We get to create a community around it, and they get to help create this community that we're all going to be a part of. And it's going to be a blast. For so sure. when it comes to mini camp, did you go to mini camp this year? No. So I. I started writing articles during mini camp because uh, okay. I, I don't I I applied before and then I started writing during so but I mean it was good I had some topics to write about did you go to any of the camps? No, I wasn't able to. I'm up in Portland. Many camps were going on. I was actually heading up to Alaska for time with my family. My dad's up there, uh, so I wasn't I able see. to go. I kept track as much as I could. Did you hear anything good coming out of mini camp for the Guardians? Anything that stood out to you? Um, personally, I was really impressed by Matt McGoin. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, you expect certain things out of someone who played in the NFL, started games like that. But the more you looked into it and the more you saw in video, he was, you know, the relationships he was creating with his wide receivers and the way he was getting the ball to guys, 
I'm actually really yeah. excited to see what he can do. I don't think he's necessarily at NFL level anymore, but I think that he's 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 more than a leader. He's gonna you know he's he's got this experience that I think could actually propel the Guardians to a higher level of play than even expected because the Guardians roster isn't anything phenomenal. And, you know yeah. it, it's it's not up and down. You know got you know names that you know like some of these yeah. other teams but but all of these guys are talented pure athletes and that's what i really oh, enjoy yeah. about them totally when i look at this roster i see kind of the same thing and matt mcgloin he's for me first off when kevin gilbride's system i think he's gonna thrive i think because he has that guy mm-hmm. like eli manning thrive in it and things so i think this is a system that he can thrive in i think he can do really well mm-hmm. and also just he's almost kind of been here before doubted yes. um looked down upon i mean he walked on to penn state and ended up ended up like fighting for a job almost his entire career to get into the mm-hmm. nfl so it's almost like he's been here before and i think it's a useful tool for him because he's ne- like it's almost like he's almost never been the best guy wherever he's been at but he's been thrust into the opportunity and mm-hmm. most a lot of these guys were the best guys where they were at but when they got in the nfl they weren't so it's a little different for them now but he's yeah, a guy that's, that's used to this and can like help his team go through this and hopefully fight for a playoff spot that's it that's exactly what the xfl is all about i mean the these are guys who are coming into this league with some experience but there's also guys with no professional experience there's plenty of people there's plenty of people in this league that you know it's uh, let me say like this it's diverse and that's what's going to be interesting and i think having such a reliable guy like mcloin is going to be big time Oh yeah, definitely. Because I look at guys like on other rosters, guys like Jordan Tamu, um, even Aaron Murray hasn't had a lot of experience in the league, and other teams like that. Just they kind of see it, they might be lacking that experience at a QB standpoint, that may hurt them a little bit later down the road. Um, so I think we got really something special on Matt McGloin. The fact that he's taken NFL snaps, he's been in under pressure situations. I mean, he was mm-hmm. super popular that twenty. I can't remember exactly what season it was. I think yeah, it was twenty fourteen. 2013 2014 around that time yeah where you I had like a couple of his games today. i i honestly yeah. can't remember i wrote an article on it today and i i just highlighted the fact that he's done this before and mm-hmm. he the, the advantage the guardians have with him and he's impressed in minicamp and he's i could only i could only say you know good things going forward about him i i can almost guarantee yeah. that because he's he's a he's a professional and some of these guys just flat out aren't. They're they're raw talent. But McGloin's definitely someone we can rely on. I know. And there's nothing to say against those guys that are raw talent. They're here to learn exactly. and that's what they're gonna do. And just and we're just praising Matt McGloin because he's gonna be a guy that helps those guys out. And that's something I'm exactly. really intrigued in with him. Are you gonna be going to training camp at all? Um, I hope. I, I haven't talked to anyone about that. The only thing is, is that I believe it's in Houston. So, oh yeah, it is. I forgot. That's, I always forget that. Cause it's so weird to me. That's so weird yeah. to me that they're all so, having a combined training camp. So un- unless unless something happens, I just don't think it's going to be realistic for me to be in that area. So I totally I mean, get that. I'd, it won't be for me either. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. I mean, a, a few years down the road, maybe when things are really, you know, I, I'm, I know, you know, on the right track, I'll definitely be there, but. As of now, it's just not something that's realistic. Oh yeah, a few years from now, from now they may not be having training camp in a in one localized spot. Yeah. So, all right. So now we're gonna get into a little bit of what I'm gonna be talking about. What I talk about most on this episode is just the wide receivers, safeties, and cornerbacks. I know you said you're gonna have a couple guys coming in um, when you came into here to talk about. So, what are those? Some of those guys. So at the wide receiver position, I think it's only fair to highlight D'Angelo Yancey. Um, yeah. In a in a strange way, he's become the poster boy for the team. Um, the guy was a star at Purdue, and oh, yeah. he's obviously got talent. Um, he's only twenty five years old, and he's going to be someone who comes in, and I could see he gets some really legitimate looks at the NFL. He spent limited time with Green Bay; nothing really happened there. Yeah, but he's a guy who I could see. Um, making a very quick impact on this league, especially with McLoin. I think that I think that McLoin's going to find Yancey a lot open. I think that yep. they'll have a great relationship, be, considering their play styles almost feed off each other. Yeah. McLoin's a guy who's not necessarily gifted athletically, but he will he will get the ball to everyone on the field in the right positions, 
Yancey's a guy who's going to be all over the field. He's going to put himself in those positions. And at the wide receiver position, I could just see him being a standout. I, I could just see it now. As a guy he reminds me of that used to be in Kevin Gilbride's offense is Hakeem Nix. I don't know why. It's the big size, the athleticism. He just kind of, remi- kind of reminds me that. I know he had a little bit of a problem with drops in college. I remember like seeing it when I was watching yeah. some of his tape, he had a little bit of a problem with drops. That can obviously be fixed. You just practice, practice, practice. But I mean, his athleticism and he's he's actually a decent, he's a def- decent on the press release, which is huge. Those are things I really liked when I watched this film. Just the hands is a little worrying, but his athleticism and everything just kind of offsets that. And I could see him playing kind of a Hakeem Nicks role in this offense mm-hmm. because he's big, athletic, yeah, kind sure. of like him. Yeah, I, I, you know, he's, in my opinion, I think he'd thrive in a deep threat role, but I don't think you're going to get that necessarily with McGloin. I'd like yeah. to see him going over the middle, uh, becoming more versatile at the position, and even being a force on special teams if need be. Because he's, oh, he's yeah. definitely he's got the speed. He's it's all there. It's just a matter mm-hmm. of how this is all gonna you know come together. Oh yeah, and like most of the receivers in this league, route running is gonna be the biggest thing for him. If he can work and develop his route running, it's gonna be huge for him. Mm-hmm. Because even yeah, at sure. Purdue, he did not run a large route tree. It was a lot of like slants, hitches, and goes because he was that deep threat there. And so I can see a lot of that. When it comes to his game, he just needs to work on his route running, diversify his route tree, and that's going to be huge. Yeah, for sure. So, yeah. No. What's the next guy you're going to talk about? Okay, so the next guy I have on my list is Demetrius Cox, uh, safety. Um, Now, Cox is – he's a little bit problematic, but <laughs> hey, I can get past that, you know. So he actually played in four games for Carolina. Um, he was yep. then released and signed to Cincinnati. At MSU, he was a standout um, for good reasons and for bad reasons. He uh, he had a run-in with a, a cab driver or something. I mean, I'm not going to talk about it too much because, yeah, honestly, it's just not my business, and I'm here for him as an athlete. Oh, yeah. And that's that's why he's here. At only 25 years old, he brings raw talent to this team. And oh, yeah. He obviously had potential, you know, coming out of uh, coming out of Michigan to be looked at as Michigan State as somebody who who offers more than advertised. I think with the right coaching and the and a good amount of uh, I don't know, like changing. He, you know, if if he can change his game to fit the XFL's rules to fit it all. I think he'll be somebody who also gets picked up by an NFL team, especially for the long term with four games under his belt. Oh, yeah. I noticed a couple of things when I watched him. He played a little bit of cornerback and safety. He was versatile, which I liked, especially for my safeties. I like when they are trusted to be able to cover like that. And the one thing I noticed that was a little iffy about his game is he seemed to struggle a little bit with run fits, which worried me. You never want a safety that mm-hmm. struggles with his run fits. He's got to be able to go downhill and make the right play and take the right angle. But I mean, his athleticism was good. He had four interceptions and one forced fumble in college. He had two touchdowns. So he makes plays and that's a big thing at safety. You got to be able to make plays. One guy yeah, I was no, looking I'm at. Excited. Oh yeah, me too. One guy I was looking at safety was Wesley Sutton from Northern Arizona. He's a guy yeah, I really I like too. He looks I love interesting. His, I he, go ahead. I was just gonna say he looks interesting. He's another one of those guys who's obviously raw talent, and mm-hmm. he's he's probably you know blessed to be here. But he's also he's here for a reason. You know, mm-hmm. the, he's he's gonna offer, uh, you know, raw ability at a position where it's it's very it's not very you know the depth that at defensive back just isn't there in most leagues. So oh, yeah. to see him, you know, I've heard good things about him because, you know, you, you hear these reports on how everything's going. You see the tape. Mm-hmm. He's just somebody that I'm interested in seeing how his career pans out more. And, like, he fits a role that I don't really see in this this safety group for the Guardians. He's kind of a more of a free safety type, and a lot of the guys we have are more downhill, in-the-box kind of guys. I didn't get to see a lot of A.J. Hendy, so I, I couldn't find film on him. But I know Wesley Sutton is more of a free rate, free safety type. He's got really good range and good ball skills. As I'm a little worried 
injury consistency consistency wise. I know he had some injuries in college, but I mean, when I watch his tape, he just flies across the field when he's that deep safety, which is really good at that safety spot. It's something I think we might be missing until mm-hmm. hey, he yeah, comes for in. Sure. Yeah, I mean, there, there's in any league, there's not that that at, at these positions, especially you know, the best talents in the NFL right now. There's no denying that. But a guy like this can really develop into a player who who offers more to a team than meets the eye. Oh yeah. So now we're down to that last position at cornerback. Who's the who's one guy that really piques your interest at the corner position? So. This is probably one of my favorite guys on the roster in general. Dewan, Dewan Neal, Dewan Neal. I mean, okay. I, I would never know how to say his name correctly, but he spent eight days with the Redskins, okay? And honestly, you look at it, you'd think he would have spent a year with the Redskins. He's, a, he's very young. Last year was his rookie season in the NFL. Mm-hmm. But what I love most about him is that he's coming out of Shepherd University, which is a Division II school. And he represents everything it means to be in the XFL. This oh. guy is is just oozing with talent. You watch his film, and you can see that something's there. He just needs the right people, the right experienced coaching to put it all together and put him on the field to become a force and to become a guy who, you know, five years down the road will be saying, I can't believe he was in the XFL. And while the XFL is a, is going to be a legitimate league, there's always going to be better talent. And this is one of those guys who yeah. I think will, if he can stick around on this roster and work hard, that he will give himself an opportunity. Because when I see him, you know, I see the footwork there. I see, you know, the hands are obviously there. And it's, he's a playmaker at the cornerback position. Oh, and yeah. that's, it's not necessarily rare, but he could easily, I pull him up off the edge. Have him go make a big tackle. What I could see for a guy like this is like a mini Jamal Adams at cornerback, where you okay. can move him around and slot him around because he's that versatile. He's got so the size too. This is too. one guy that I exactly, and this is one guy that I feel passionately about being successful. And there's not many on this roster that I can say that for because it is such raw talent. This oh, yeah. is this, in my opinion, is undeniable. There's a lot of guys on this roster who are just extremely raw and just don't necessarily fit into schemes and things like that. This is somebody who I could see being versatile and making plays all over the field, which isn't going to happen much for many guys because these oh, rosters yeah. are big. Oh yeah. I mean, this dude, he also hits. I was watching some of his tape and some mm-hmm. of the hits, man, he molly whops some people. He, <laughs> he moves sure. downhill with a force. That's something I love from the corner position. I like corners that will go up and, and make plays in the run. It's not the most important for me thing for me when I watch the corner position. I understand. Usually you're not asked to do that. If a run's getting to your corner, usually you already failed 10 times. So mm-hmm. yeah. it's just good to see a guy that's willing to go make that play. It's kind of a plus where there doesn't need to be a plus. One guy at corner yeah, that... That's, that's exa- oh, I was just going to say, this is a guy that even though he could be your number one cornerback, I'd put him at the two slot. I'd put your best man coverage guy against the receiver, put him at the two slot and let him fly around and let him make plays wherever you can find them. That's just all I have to say on him. And when it comes to cover corners, this next guy I want to talk about really quick is just one guy that piques my interest. I interview him in this episode, actually. Ranthony Tejada. Oh, nice. He's from TCU. Man, I love his man technique. He's just, he's sticky. That's the one thing I can describe him as. When I watched, I looked up on YouTube as like CFL practice tape. Every single rep, he's on his man. The guy may catch it. He's a little smaller. He's like 5'10". It's not the shortest guy in the world, Mm -hmm. but he's a little smaller. But, man, he's got good speed. His man tech is good. His press technique is fantastic. It has everything I've ever been taught as a defensive back, and he does it perfectly. Mm -hmm. So when I watch him, I'm just like, oh, I don't care how if he's small to you or anything. Put him on the outside. Let him work. He will lock people down. That's something I even saw when I watched him at TCU. Like, Sometimes the um, cut, sometimes Gary Patterson's scheme is a little mean to corners because they puts them on an island a lot. And Gary Patterson's the coach at TCU, but mm-hmm. he seemed to thrive there. He was an All Big Twelve corner in a in a division that's has a plethora of like fast moving offenses and a lot of skill at the receiver position, and he just he thrived there. 
So he's one guy I really love. He yeah. had 30 passes defense when he was at TCU. I don't know. This is one guy I think if he doesn't make the roster, it'll be a travesty because I think he has everything he needs to be a really good man corner. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm looking into him a little bit right now. I am somewhat familiar with him. He definitely seems to to be able to put this all together. I mean, he's got some NFL experience, it looks like. Mm-hmm. He's gone Spent up a little time the with Washington. Playing at TCU, that, you know, that's playing some real football. Oh, yeah. This guy, you know, he's he's not anything. I, I wouldn't say he's a necessarily like a spectacular talent for the XFL. But I think he's a team guy. He want you want this man on your team. I think oh, yeah. because he's going to be consistent. It seems with with all mm-hmm. his footwork and you know everything I'm seeing on this page right now, I'm pretty sure that this is a guy that could play for any team in this league and even going forward. Oh yeah, uh, he's just one dude. I've just I've kind of locked onto as my guy. Him and Frank Ginda for the linebacker. Those are two guys I've just locked onto as my guys when I look at this roster. Yeah. I've always been a defensive guy myself, so those guys, defensive guys are guys who I stick to. And these two guys are just guys I'm like, they need to make this roster or I'm going to be a little mad. Well, I mean, the the cuts are going to be interesting because oh, yeah. they all of these teams have tons of guys on the roster, mm-hmm. and there's going to be a lot of talent floating around. And I could see a lot of, you know, guys being picked up, moved, oh, yeah. you know, with the, with the new uh with the new rules, I could see certain guys fitting better into certain schemes, oh, yeah. and that could cause for a lot of transactions mm-hmm. between teams. So I'm definitely excited for that. Oh, yeah, I know. And this cornerback position is going to be really interesting. We got eight guys on the roster, and I only expect five of them to make it probably because that's usually how these rosters kind of tend to be built. So it's going to be really yeah. interesting who makes this roster because there's a lot of guys that are pretty similar. So it'll be interesting to see how that works together. Yeah, but I mean, think a lot of these guys... Game. Go yeah, ahead. a lot of these guys are are uh, are coming out of big schools, but they haven't had it easy after college. No, and I know they're all willing to work for it. And I, there's a few of them that I think are going to be surprises. If you even if you look on the offensive side, which I'm more familiar with, there's a few linemen. There's a you know there's there's certain guys that you that I've gotten feelings about. Um, that could just be on the roster and you know, make an impact going forward. And it's it's not a matter of the the impact that they make. It's not if it's immediate or not. It's what they offer to the team more than anything because oh. this is going to be a league where view viewers are going to come from teams winning. It's not yeah. going to be the players because realistically, nobody really knows who these guys are. So if the team yeah. can win games, things will go well. Yeah, definitely. I mean, winning games, obviously, in any team is the most important thing. And especially in this league, once you win games, you'll start getting more viewers. It's just winning creates a community. You see it with my hometown team, the Carolina Panthers or the Cleveland Browns or even the Jets. I mean, (laughs) no offense to your Jets, but when you're losing, you don't have community. So winning cures all ills. So. We'll see what we'll see what happens I mean, coming this this coming season, but I'm excited. I think this roster has a pretty decent collection of players that could work really well in, in Kevin Gilbride's system. So, yeah, I mean Gilbride's a real deal too, and I, oh, yeah. I'm excited to see what you can do with these guys. You know, I think reality might hit pretty hard for uh, certain aspects of this league where yeah. play just might not be up to par. But it's not it's not going to be close to college level play. There's a no. lot of NFL talent coming in here. Oh yeah. There's a I think there's gonna be a lot of roster transactions where it's gonna create an environment where the league is competitive, people care, right. and you know, you're not gonna to watch to just see what the XFL is up to. You're gonna to yeah. watch to see what the Guardians are doing on Saturday mm-hmm. or Sunday and see if they're gonna win the game. You're oh, yeah. not just there for the XFL. You're there, you know, to support whatever team you support. And that's going to be the biggest thing for the XFL is creating those that team support because you don't want just fans of the league watching because they're not as invested. If you get guys supporting certain teams pretty adamantly, then we get a lot of people invested in this in this league and these teams yeah. and it'll make for great TV and it'll make the XFL a lot of money, which is kind of the main goal here, and we cannot forget that. Yeah, I mean, if this league can stay afloat, I think it can do some great things. Oh, yeah. 
Well, I've taken up a lot of your time. Thank you for coming no, on. No, man, it's fine. It's been a pleasure. Where can they find you, man? No problem. Um, so you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at underscore Gavin underscore Hayes underscore. I know it's a, it's not the easiest, but that's just Gavin Hayes. You look my name up, you'll see some articles. I Make sure to check out XFL board and read some articles. I mean, we've got people reporting on every single team, Dragons, Wildcats, Renegades, what is it, Roughnecks, Vipers, yep. Battlehawks, and Defenders and Guardians. We've got people reporting everywhere. So come check our articles out. It's going to be great. If this league can make, you know, make an impact and stick, we're on the ground floor of it. So just know, you know, we're here to give you the news and everything like that. Absolutely, man. Hey, everybody, check out XFL Board. I read some of their articles. They're amazing. Thank you for coming on, man. It's been a pleasure. No problem, man. Thank you so much. Absolutely. All right. Bye. Welcome back from the break. Welcome to the third shift of this episode. Hope you guys enjoyed the interview with Gavin Hayes. I know I for sure did. But anyways, now we're going to go talk about our safeties. And I'm going to tell you what I look for in safeties first. The first thing I look for is range. That goes from sideline to sideline in coverage or from coming up field against the run. Range just means where he is on the field and how far he can make it to the next spot, how fast he can get there. So I look for guys with great range, meaning they can roam sideline to sideline and still make plays on the ball. One great way to look for this is when you're watching film, if you see a safety come from the middle of the field all the way to the sideline to make a play on a go route, that shows great range. The next thing I look for is run fits. When I look at run fits, the biggest thing I look for is the ability to get off of blocks and sustain gap responsibility. So a lot of safeties are expected to be part of the run defense, while corners are not usually. Safeties are usually expected to be downhill and make plays in the run. So they've got to be able to make tackles, but most importantly, they got to be able to get off blocks and sustain gap responsibility. They can't be making mistakes there because usually they're the second to last line of defense. The next thing I look for is instincts and anticipation. This is just their ability to make plays, really. You have to understand route concepts and offensive concepts, and you have to be able to make a play on the ball. That's what I mean by instincts and anticipation because that's one of the biggest parts of making a play and forcing a turnover. So now we're going to go ahead and get into our breakdowns of each guy. We're going to start with Draven Askew Henry, or D-A-H. He's from West Virginia University. He's going to be wearing number 22. Don't really have an age for him. I guess probably 25 or 26, considering when he graduated from college. He's six feet tall. He weighs 202 pounds, good size. His college stats, he played in 51 games. He started all of them. He had 155 solo tackles, 53 assisted tackles, nine and a half tackles for loss, six interceptions, one touchdown, and 10 passes defensed. And he spent a preseason in Pittsburgh during his time in the NFL, so he had a little bit of a cup of tea there. When I watch this film, I noticed he has decent speed and he can play both safety spots, which I like. He's pretty versatile in that way. He may struggle to shed some blocks, which is a little bit worrying. I usually like a guy to be able to get off of blocks really well, but most of the times he struggled was against offensive linemen because he in the box role in the game I watched. So it's not as worrying. Linemen blocks are hard to get off of because you're not nearly as strong, but usually you want to try to avoid them and dodge them instead of just taking them head on. He struggles a little bit with run fits and run responsibilities. I think with a good coach, though, that can be solved. He's a pretty good athlete. Like I said, he's got decent speed. He's got decent burst, which I really like. I didn't see a whole lot in coverage, but I think he's got the chops to do it. I think it could be a decent, strong safety where he has to cover flat and curl type zones while playing in the box as well. And he's a guy I like. I think he'll end up being one of the safeties either rotating in or starting just due to his athletic ability and his resume. He played a lot, meaning he can make plays and games. The next guy we're going to talk about is Demetrius Cox. He wears number, he's going to wear number 36 for the Guardians. He went to Michigan State. He's 25 years old. He's six foot and 200 pounds, almost the same build as Dravon Askew Henry. These guys are very similar. In college, he played in 40 games. He had 91 solo tackles, 75 assisted tackles, five and a half tackles for loss, one sack, four interceptions, two touchdowns, two fo- fumble recoveries, and one forced fumble. In the NFL, he had more than a cup of tea. He spent time with Cincinnati in the preseason. He spent time with Carolina in the preseason and eventually got some reps on special teams with Carolina. Then he was on Arizona's practice squad and in Cincinnati's practice squad. Some of the things I like about him, he played cornerback and safety in college, so he shows a lot of versatility, which I like. He understands coverages very well, which is a really good thing. 
he's a pretty good athlete from what I saw. He's able to move very well. Not the fastest guy, but not a lot of these guys are safety. You don't have to be the fastest position. He kind of struggles with run fits a little bit, which makes me kind of hesitate sometimes, but he was still able to make tackles and make plays on the ball. We highlighted him in our talk with Gavin Hayes. He's a guy I'm really intrigued in, and I think he can end up making plays for the Guardians. Next guy we're going to talk about is AJ Hendy. He's going to wear number 33. He's from Maryland. He's 26 years old, six feet tall, and weighs 210 pounds. He's a little bit bigger than the other guys. He played in 33 games, had 91 solo tackles, 51 assisted tackles, three sacks, two interceptions, two touchdowns, seven passes defense, and four fumbles recoveries. He seems to be around the ball a lot, which I like. In the NFL, he spent some time with Miami and had some special teams reps there during the regular season. Was on the Chargers practice squad and with the Houston in the preseason. Like I said, he gets around the ball a lot. I didn't get to see a lot of film of him. I tried to find stuff, but I couldn't. From his pro day, he seems like a pretty decent athlete. So he's a guy I can see fighting for a spot. This position is going to be really big competition because we have a lot of guys with similar builds and similar abilities, all fighting for those four or five spots. I expect this to be really a battle in training camp, and I think he's going to be a big part of it. But I couldn't find a lot of film on him. But I think he's a decent athlete. He seems to be around the ball a lot. So if he makes a bunch of plays in training camp, he'll end up on the roster. Next guy I want to talk about is Andrew Soro. He's going to wear number 30 for the Guardians. He's from Florida Atlantic. He's 23 years old, 6'2", 210 pounds. He's got really good size to him. He's got good length. In college, he had 79 solo tackles, 66 assisted tackles, 10 and a half tackles for loss, three interceptions, one fumble recovery, and three passes defensed. In the NFL, he spent some time with Kansas City during their preseason. From his film, he looked like a plus tackler. Didn't see him miss a lot of tackles, made a lot of plays in the run. He looked like he could play well in the box. He really likes to lay the wood. Not really sure about his coverage ability. He makes plays on the ball, which is good. He had three interceptions, but he didn't have a lot of passes defensed. Safety isn't really a position you get a ton of passes defensed in, though. So we'll just have to wait and see with him. But I think he could end up being a really useful tool as a down-in-the-box safety that can cover a little bit better than maybe some of these other guys. So I expect him to make the roster. I like his ability. He seems like a really good athlete. If he doesn't really contribute defensively, he could contribute on a lot of special teams due to his size and his just athletic ability and his ability to tackle. He's a guy I really like, and I kind of expect him to make, a, make some plays for our team and end up on the roster. The next guy I'm going to talk about is Wesley Sutton. He's from Northern Arizona. He's going to wear number 28. Northern Arizona is a little bit smaller school, D1AA, so the competition isn't as fierce as some of these other guys. But I couldn't really find an age for him. I'd guess he's around 25, like most of these guys. He's six feet tall and 185 pounds. He's a little bit on the slimmer side from these guys, but there's a reason why. He played more free safety in college instead of strong safety, so he was a little rangier. In college, he played in 42 games, had 96 solo tackles, 56 assisted tackles, 10 and a half tackles for loss, six interceptions, one forced fumble, and 18 passes defensed. Din doesn't really have any experience in the NFL that I could find. Well, what I like about him, he's rangy. He's got really good ball skills. I'm a little worried in injury-wise. I know he had a couple injuries in college. I don't know how serious they were. I like his skills. He seems to really understand pass concepts really knows how to make a play on the ball and use proper technique when going for a football. And I think he could play well in a free safety spot. We don't really have a lot of guys. Maybe Andrew Soro could, but we don't really have a lot of guys that can play that free safety spot. I haven't seen a lot of AJ Hendy film, so maybe he can. But I think Wesley Sutton really is the only guy there to play the free safety spot that we currently have on the roster. And I think he could really thrive there. I like his ball skills. Like I said, he's got really good range. He's able to make plays downfield, as you can see from the 10 and a half tackles for loss. That's for a career, though, so he may have played in the box for some of those, but he still makes plays in the run, which is good, but I can see him really playing that free safety role well in our team. I expect him to make the roster just because he's the only guy that really fits that mold. The last guy we're going to talk about for these safeties is Aaron Taylor. He's originally from Ball State. He was going to wear number 37 for the Guardians. I don't really have an age. I'm, he looks a little bit older. He probably 26 is my best guess. He's 5'11 and 208 pounds, so he's a stockier guy. He had 110 solo tackles in college, 98 assisted tackles. He played in 48 games. He had three and a half sacks, 18 tackles for loss, four passes defensed, and one forced fumble and two fumble recoveries. In the NFL, he had minicamp invites to Green Bay and Tennessee, so they gave him a quick look. They didn't end up signing him, but he still got a look at the pros. One of my biggest things with him is he played outside linebacker in Ball State. He wasn't really a safety. He played a little bit of safety later in his career. He's big. When you watch him, he just looks big. He plays big. He's a big hitter too, and he's a nasty demeanor. I like that for my in the box safeties. Is where I think he fits is as an in the box safety, and I like that nasty demeanor from them. 
He moves downhill with a vengeance. He tries to lay the wood on people. I'd like to see him wrap up a little bit more in the run, but otherwise he has good run fits. He understands how to play the run because he's a linebacker. It's in his blood. And I think he could be a good fit there at that strong safety spot or in a 4-2-5 as that down in the box safety. So we'll just have to wait and see where he ends up lining up for us. He could end up moving back to outside linebacker, but he's a little bit small for that. So I expect him to stay at safety. Other than that, there's not a lot of coverage stuff on him. He was most of his highlights and most of his film is him playing the run. So it's important to watch how he does in coverage when we get a chance to see him. And if he plays well, he could end up being that strong safety. But I think he's going to be the guy that most struggles with the transition just due to the coverage aspect of it. So right now we have six safeties on the roster that could increase as training camp starts up, but I expect us to have probably six or seven on the roster. I expect us to keep four or five of them. They're all quality guys. They're all able to play their role very well, and I think we got a little bit of decent depth here. I don't really have any locks other than probably Wesley Sutton because of the role he plays, but I think him and Drayvon Askew Henry, DAH, are going to be the starters for us. That's who I kind of expect to make the most impact in camp. Just from what I saw on tape, they seem to be the most versatile at the safety positions. I think Andrew Soro, Aaron Taylor, Demetrius Cockin, and Jay Handy are going to be fighting for those final two, three spots. I think Demetrius I think Demetrius Cox is most likely to make an impact in camp. Just due to his versatility, I think he'd be kind of a Swiss army knife in our defense, moving around a lot, playing free safety, strong safety cornerback, working in the slot. So... I don't think Jim Herman is going to use him that way. I don't know if he's going to use him that way. But he's that's one way I can see Demetrius Cox fitting in. And then I see Andrew Soro making it as a special team guy. Same with Aaron Taylor. I just don't know much about AJ Hendy, so I can't predict where he'd end up on this roster. So we'll just have to wait and see. This is going to be a really big competition in camp to see who comes out of the safety position. I think Wesley Sutton and DAH are for sure going to make it out. Those are my two locks. After that, it's kind of a crapshoot. Not in a bad way, but I, we don't know who's going to come out of that battle. That's what I expect from the safety position. Super excited to watch it. It's a position I hold close to my heart, and I'm super excited for that. We're going to go to a break real quick, and then we're going to into our corners. Hey everybody, welcome back from break. We're going to start covering our cornerbacks now. My favorite position to watch personally, just due to the nature of it, and I'll explain that a little bit more in a second. First, I'm going to get into what I look for in a corner. The first thing I look for is man press technique and how they are when they press a wide receiver. There's a couple things that we need to make sure we look for when you watch man press technique. The first thing is how they balance patience and aggressiveness. The cornerback position is a position of balance in my eyes. You have to balance whether you're patient in the press versus where you go after this guy. I've heard great talks from Deion Sanders about this, where in a video he's discussing how a receiver's stance dictates whether he's going to go for the guy's throat as he puts it, or if he's going to sit back and be patient and wait for him to make the first move. And that's one of the ways I think when you have to balance patience versus aggressiveness when you do press. And then also just the technique of you knowing which hand to strike with and where to go with your feet. That's super important when it comes to man press. The next thing I look for is their man technique. When even if they're on off reference, how quick they are in and out of breaks when they're covering a certain guy and how they understand leverage. Like I said, for receivers, it's a big thing for cornerbacks to understand leverage. And that's why man technique is so important. And the reason I focus on man when I watch corners is because that's how you determine who's going to be a really good corner versus just a good corner. Most good corners can play zone very well, and really good corners can play zone very well too, but when you look at the man coverage, the best corners are great at man coverage, while the good corners are not always great at man coverage. So that's the first thing kind of you have to look for when you try to evaluate a cornerback. The next thing I look for is their hips, how smooth their hips are in and out of breaks, how quick they can flip their hips and coverage, and their ball skills. And I'm talking about good hands. That means they make, make plays on the ball with two hands and make catches but also how good they are with their technique at punching balls out of a receiver's hands and forcing incompletions when the ball is already in the receiver's hand. Because you're not always going to be there before the ball's in the receiver's hands. Sometimes you got to get there and you got to fight for the ball and force it out. And that's a big part of ball skills that I think is a little bit underrated when we hear, oh, ball skills, can this guy catch a pass? And da, da, da. No, when it comes to cornerback, a big part of ball skills is fighting through the ball and making a play on the ball no matter in what form. Now we're going to go ahead and get into our player breakdowns. We're going to start with Terrence Alexander. He's from LSU, and he spent four years at Stanford as well. He's going to wear number 31 for the Guardians. 
Don't really have an age on him. I'm guessing he's going to be a little bit older since he's a graduate transfer. He's going to be probably about 26, maybe 27 at the oldest. He's 5'10 and 190 pounds, so he's a little bit on the shorter side, but he's a little stocky. His college stats are he's played in 35 games. He had 59 solo tackles, 21 assisted tackles, one interception, one and a half tackles for loss, 10 passes defense, and one forced fumble. He spent a preseason in Minnesota as well. This guy's got a really interesting story. Coming out of Stanford, he was offered a six-figure job right out of Stanford. But instead of taking that job, he decided to take a chance on himself and transferred to LSU for a one-year deal to fight for a spot. Not really a one-year deal, but to fight for a spot to start on that roster. I don't think he really started. didn't work out totally for him, but you can tell this guy loves football. And he loves to play the game, and he's willing to take a chance with himself to make it happen. Some of the things I found out about him, he's really physical, which I like, especially at the line of scrimmage. He's a pretty good man, corner, a good tackler, so he's good downhill. He's got a little question about his man technique and his hips. His hips look a little stiff when I watch him, and his ball skills aren't great. He struggles sometimes to make a play on the ball when it's already in the receiver's hands. He could be a really good special teams for us. He's a pretty good athlete. He, Like I said, he's physical and a really good tackler, and that's kind of what you look for in a special teams guy. And I think he can cover pretty well, too, especially in the slot and the outside. He's played both. So he's really versatile in that way. I could see him kind of making the roster as one of those fifth or sixth guys. I don't see him being a starting guy right away. He's a lot of experience, though, which is really good and kind of makes him look a little more enticing as a roster option in my eyes. Next guy we're going to talk about is Bryce Jones. He's going to wear number 29 for the Guardians. He's from Akron. He's 25 years old. He's 5'11 and weighs 182 pounds, not 28, 182 pounds. In college, he played in 39 games. He had 101 solo tackles, 46 assisted tackles, nine and a half tackles for loss, three interceptions, 12 passes defensed, and three fumble recoveries. And he spent a preseason with Houston in the NFL. So he has a cup of tea there, like most of these guys. He's more of a slot guy. He played a lot in the slot. I could see him transitioning to a kind of a safety role as well. He's got really good technique when I watch him, but one of his flaws in his technique is he has his eyes in the backfield a lot. So when he's in man coverage and you're on a guy, unless you're a step in front of him and you have your hand on his hip, which means you're in phase, you don't want your eyes back at the quarterback. You should always have your eyes on your man just in case he breaks one way or another because if you don't, you could lose him. That's kind of problem. He peeks a lot into the backfield, which can hurt him in man coverage. So that's why I think he's more of a zone guy, which I think he could thrive at safety maybe. And he's also a pretty good guy on run D. So those are kind of things I look for when I watch a safety. And this guy strikes me as a possible safety type. So I like him. I think he has a chance to make the roster if he transitions positions to that safety type. He could be a free safety kind of guy. It's really rough for him at corners because of that one flaw in his technique. He struggles a little bit in press, but I think that's where he could thrive is if he transitioned to safety. Next guy we're going to talk about is Trey Mathis. He doesn't really have a number yet because he's a new signee. Went to Toledo. He's 24, 25. He's six feet tall and 188 pounds. He's got pretty good size. He played outside corner at Toledo. In college, he played in 51 games, had 90 solo solo tackles, 30 assisted tackles, three and a half tackles for loss, six interceptions, 29 passes defensed, one forced fumble, and one fumble recovery. In the NFL, he had a practice squad spot with Minnesota. In coverage, he's got really good technique. He's really good in the press. He's really patient. He rotated a senior year, which worries me a little bit. He wasn't a full-time starter. That could be due to injury. I'm not sure. I don't know the whole story there. I have a little bit of question about his experience. He played in 51 games. I don't know how many he started, though. And I don't know about his hips. His hips look a little tight, and he doesn't have the best top-end speed, but he does have ball skills. You can tell just from his 29 passes defensed and his six interceptions, he's able to make a play on the ball a lot, which is really good, and it's something I really like to watch. He's also a decent athlete. He doesn't have the top-end speed you need, though. I've watched some film of him just getting toasted when he's trying to chase after a guy on the run. He doesn't really catch up to them. He sometimes loses his ground. So that's a little worrying, but... I think his height and his ball skills and his press technique make him a very viable candidate to be a rotating guy or even a starter at that outside corner position. There's a lot of competition here in this cornerback position to find out who's going to start. Next guy is going to be Dewan Neal. We talked about him with Gavin Hayes a little bit. He's a guy he really likes. I'm a little more lukewarm on him, and I'll explain why here in a second. He's from Shepherd College. It's a smaller school. He's going to wear number 26 for the Guardians. He's got really good ball skills. He's a big hitter. The thing I'm worried about is his speed and cover skill. That's why I like what Gavin Hayes said about him. I could see him making a move to safety as well. He's six feet tall and 190 pounds in college. He played in 43 games, had 95 tackles, 17 passes defense, and three interceptions. And my biggest worries is his coverage skills and his speed. He didn't look like the fastest guy on tape, and his coverage skills were a little bit worrying. He looks like he has tight hips, and he doesn't look like he's always in the right position to make a play. 
I think his decent to good athleticism kind of helped him out a lot in college. He loves to run up in the run and make plays in the run. So I could see him ending up transitioning to safety a little bit just due to his lack of top end speed a little bit and coverage and hip fluidity. Ended up being a big hitter there, being kind of rangy, understanding concepts. That's one thing I could see with him is transitioning to the role that Gavin Hayes talked about. And that warmed me up to him a little bit more, but still just those worries with coverage and speed make me a little more less hyped about him than Gavin Hayes was. Next guy we're going to talk about is David Rivers. This is a guy I'm really excited about. He's from Youngstown State. He wears number 24 for us. He's 25 years old, six feet tall and 190 pounds. I couldn't really find any college stats on him. Youngstown State website is trash. Not trying to be mean to their website developer, but you cannot find any stats on there whatsoever. Spent a lot of time in the NFL, though. He spent a preseason in Green Bay, a preseason with the New York Jets, practice squad at Tampa Bay, practice squad with Miami. He was IR'd by Tampa Bay, and then he spent a preseason in Miami. What I like about him the most is he showed flashes as a lockdown corner. He makes a lot of plays on balls. He's got pretty good ball skills. He's a really good athlete. He's not the fastest guy. You kind of saw that when he played Eastern Washington. He got beat deep by guys like Kendrick Bourne and Cooper Cup, who are both NFL level receivers. But I saw some really good flashes against him. He's really patient with his press. He's got good size too, so I could see him lining up at that outside cornerback spot. The guy I really like at that outside corner spot just due to the flashes. He's got a really high ceiling, which I enjoy. Next guy I'm going to talk about is Nadir Rouse. He's from Westchester, another small school. He wears number 25 for the Guardians. He's 24 years old. He's 5'11 and 187 pounds. He's a little bit smaller than David Rivers. But when you look at his college stats, you see 34 games played, 43 solo tackles, 16 assisted tackles, 7.5 tackles for loss, 2 sacks, 6 interceptions, 16 passes defense, 3 forced fumbles, 2 blocked kicks, and 3 touchdowns. I believe two of those were from one from a blocked kick and one from a fumble recovery. I'm not 100% sure on that. He spent time in the NFL with Green Bay during their preseason. And some of the things I like about him, he's got plus speed. He's a really good athlete overall. He's got really good size. He's got really good ball skills from what I saw. He made a couple of plays on the ball while he had a giant club on his hand, which is really promising because that means he can usually make a play when there isn't a club on his hand. I like what I saw from him from an outside corner perspective. He's athletic. He's patient in his press. From what I saw, he could work on his technique a little bit. He's not always right with his hands and his feet, but he's got the right mindset for it. And then his man technique is pretty good. A little worried about his hips. I think with a little more coaching and a little bit of flexibility training, he could be really good there. And I think there's somewhere he needs to grow a little bit is his hips and his ability to read coverages. But I think he has the talent to be a good corner. And I've heard a lot of good things coming from the guardians about him and i expect him to show out in camp just due to his athleticism and size and like i said this is a really competitive position there's a lot of guys i like for this outside corner spot so it's going to be a battle the next guy i'm going to talk about is jamar summers he went to yukon he's going to wear number 21 for the guardians he's 24 years old 6'1 190 pounds he's got good size to him in college he played in 47 games had 131 solo tackles 51 assisted tackles five and a half tackles for loss one sack 12 interceptions two touchdowns 21 passes defense one forced fumble and one fumble recovery he spent time in the nfl with pittsburgh during their preseason then moved to the aaf and played for birmingham where he played very well then after the aaf he went to miami for a preseason and detroit for a preseason so he's had a cup of tea of professional football like I said, he has a good size. He's a pretty good athlete, which I like. He's not the fastest guy. He's not the guy with the most hops, but he can move really well. He's got good hips. He's really patient in his man technique. He's got the right mindset for that. But when he needs to be, he can be very aggressive. And his technique's really good as well. He's probably the best all-around corner on this roster right now. Probably the most polished. You can tell just from experience playing a lot of pro football. I think he's probably the most polished guy on this team, and he just has a nose for the football. During his time in the AAF, I believe he led the league in turnovers forced for four or five weeks, just in his ability to make plays on special teams and on defense. So he's got a lot of skills he brings to this team. He's a guy I expect to make the roster. He'll probably be our number one corner going into the season just due to his resume, and he's just the most polished guy all around. And he's a guy I really like, and I expect to make a lot of plays. The next guy we're going to talk about is my personal favorite on the roster, even though he may not be the most polished. I interview him after this shift is Ranthony Tejada. He's going to wear number 39 for the Guardians. He played at TCU, was a starter there for a couple of years. He's 24 years old. He's 5'10 and 181 pounds. He's a little bit shorter and he was a little bit skinnier coming out of college. He weighed around 160, but he bulked up coming into the league when he spent time with Washington. And he even had an interception there during the preseason. 
What I love about him is his man technique is beautiful. When you watch him, his hips are good. Comes out of bursts really quick. He's able to stick on receivers. He can struggle with size a little bit just due to his height, but he still has pretty good ball skills and has managed to fight through the ball and make plays on the ball most of the time. And then his press technique is also beautiful. This is a guy just when I watch his film, I'm salivating just at the technique of it all. He's a really technical guy, and that's why I love watching him. He's really patient when he needs to be, but he's aggressive at other times. He knows when to strike and when to hold back. It's fantastic to watch. And while off the press, he can get bullied a little bit by bigger receivers who just kind of press up against him and shove him a little bit. He's still able to stick on them. He's got really good speed. He ran a 4-4 on it during his pro day. And there's not really else I can say about him. He's probably our best pure man cover corner. I think he can struggle a little bit against the run. That's one place where he can grow, but I think he could be great as an outside corner, even due to his size. He's somebody I'm super excited to watch going into the season and my personal favorite corner on the team. I just can't wait to see him play in games. I love watching his man technique. Like I said, I love watching his press technique, and I can't wait for you guys to see all of these once we get into the season. So now, after I'm done talking about all these guys, we're going to get into who I think is going to make the roster. We have eight total corners on the team right now. We might add one or two going into camp because we just need some camp bodies. But I expect us to take five or six of them. If there's a good special teams guy, we may take six or seven. It really matters what happens at other positions. Some starters I expect to see. Jamar Summers at one corner. It's going to be Deer Rouse or David Rivers at another. And then Ranthin Tejada at the slot corner to start, but he'll eventually move outside hopefully. But I think those three guys are kind of our closest to locks. Jamar Summers is for sure going to make this roster. He's our best all-around cover corner. And I expect him to make the roster. I think Nadir Rouse and Ranthin Tejada are guys that are most likely going to make it. Ranthin Tejada, his only struggle is going to be against the run and his size. The next two or three guys I expect to be on the roster are probably going to be David Rivers, Dewan Neal, and Trey Mathis. I think Tarek Alexander could fight Dewan Neal for a spot on this team. I think Bryce Jones could as well. I think if he moves to safety, he's have a lot higher chance of making this team. But there's a lot of competition at the position. It's definitely a position of strength. And it's going to be my favorite to watch coming out of camp. I love watching corners just due to the nature of position of it all being instinct. It all being all about feel and understanding how to balance your patience and your aggressiveness. And it's probably the most difficult position athletically and instinctually out of any of the positions. Because you're expected to do exactly what the receiver's doing, but backwards. And that's why it's one of the harder positions. And you're reacting to everything as well. I'm super excited to see what happens here. I think we got a lot of good depth here. we got a lot of good talent. Next up, though, we got our interview with Ranthin Tejada in the last shift of this episode. Really hope you enjoy it. I enjoyed it when I was talking to him. He's a great interview. He's a great guy. He spreads a lot of good information about the XFL and about his journey to the XFL. Hey everybody, today we got with us Ranthony Tejada. He's a cornerback. He was from TCU, spent some time with the Redskins and the and some time in the CFL with the Ottawa Red Blacks. Four-year starter at TCU, first team All-Big 12 in 2017, 2013, second team freshman All-American, uh, 2017 Auburn Mention All-American. He's got 42 career starts, had three interceptions and 33 pass defenses at his time with TCU. Happy to, happy to have him on. How you doing today? I'm doing good, man. I appreciate you having me on today. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. So I just want to start off on, tell me about your journey to the XFL. I know it's been, it's probably been kind of hectic at times, but it's, how's it been? Uh, Well, I mean, yeah, it's definitely been a little journey for me since I got out of school, you know, a little bit over a year and a half ago. Um, You know, just had my little journey with the, you know, the Redskins and, you know, that was like a really great experience. Always, you know, been a childhood dream of mine to be able to compete in the NFL and, you know, um, you know, that experience, I learned a lot and I took away, took away a lot from it. And then, you know, right after that, I signed with the CFL and I played up there for a little bit um, all the way up until this past July. And then this opportunity with the XFL came about and I just knew it'd be the perfect opportunity for me to, you know, continue to get some good film and continue to play the game that I love and hopefully get a shot back at getting back into the NFL. Absolutely, man. That's where the money's at. So I totally mm-hmm. get that. For sure. Um, what was it like going through that draft process? I know there was combines and everything like that. Did you have to go through right. those? 
Right. So for me, man, I, I didn't get invited to any of the combine stuff. None. I didn't even go to any senior bowl games or anything like that. So I, I even though I had felt like I had a pretty good college career, I kind of flew under the radar. And then um, I had a pretty good pro day, ran, ran a good 40 time, you know, tested pretty, pretty decent. And, you know, I had a few few NFL teams calling me on draft day as far as like, you know, signing as undrafted free agent. And then, you know, I ended up feeling like the Redskins was the best opportunity for me. And, you know, I went out there and I competed my butt off. And, you know, I feel like I did pretty well. Like, you know, I had an, an interception and had a few pass breakups once the preseason games came around. And, you know, as far as the numbers thing, you know, it just didn't work out there. And, you know, it was definitely a blessing, though. I definitely say that for sure. Oh, yeah. Any chance you get mm -hmm. can be a blessing. I totally get that. Um so yeah, I know I saw your pro day stuff too. You're a really fast guy. You ran something like a four three five four four on your yeah. forty, I think it was. Yeah, it was yeah, it was around four four oh, yeah. Around there. Yeah, no. So you got some speed to you. That's something mm -hmm. like when I watched your film that I really liked because I did a little studying up. Yeah. And I noticed you're really good at you're like at man coverage and something. You're really good with your technique. So is that yeah. something you pride yourself on? And if there's anything else, what else do you pride yourself on in your game? Yeah, it's definitely that. You know, at TCU we played a lot of we were we played a lot of man coverage and a lot of just, you know, one on one. A lot of the times we didn't have a lot of help. So just over the course of the years there, just pretty much it was like an everyday thing, just working on my technique and man coverage. Um and yeah, I just I try to you know, I'm not the biggest, the biggest guy, but I try to make sure I'm able to, you know, move my feet well, have good footwork and be able to stay in front of receivers and, you know, try to make plays when the ball's in the air, too. And so that's kind of like what I pride myself on and just being, you know, a, a guy that just flies to the ball. And, you know, that's that's just kind of what I try to do every single day, even at practice and stuff like that. Absolutely. Is there anything you've been working on since you left TCU that you kind of feel like you've grown a lot in that area? Well, yeah, I mean, I definitely uh, feel like I'm a lot stronger. I'm a little bit bigger than I was in college. You know, I, I definitely put on a little bit more weight. And, you know, I feel like that's kind of helped me a, a lot as far as, you know, being a little bit more physical out there on the field and stuff like that. And uh, it's definitely one, something that, you know, people weren't too sure about coming out of college, like my size and stuff like that. But then once, you know, I got to my pro day and did all that and then, you know, playing in the league, you know, people were able to see that, yeah, I have gotten a little bit bigger and a little bit more physical. So that's what hopefully I can, you know, bring to the Guardians too. Hopefully. Um, so mm -hmm. when it comes to the XFL draft process, I know you were drafted in, I think, the 10th round of the um, right. defensive back area. How was that process? Like, did you go to, like, any XFL combines? And how, was uh, the, like, well, how did the team contact you and stuff? Well, no, I didn't go to any of the showcases or anything. But okay. at the time that stuff was going on, I was in the CFL. Okay. And I, I I knew a few coaches like that throughout the league because a few of them were on the TCU staff when I was in college. And, you know, they had they had, you know, let me know about the opportunity, about the XFL. And then when I got released um, in about like the middle part of July, um, I had a few more coaches hit me up. So I, ha I had an idea that I was probably that was probably going to be my next landing spot. And, you know, it's definitely a great opportunity because, you know, I could be back in the States and, you know, back around where people can, you know, see me play. Absolutely. So when it came, I know you guys had mini camp recently. I believe that was like a right. week and a half, two weeks ago. Right. How did that compare to the NFL and CFL when it comes to mini camps? Did it have the same feel like professionalism or anything like that? Or is there anything that was kind of lacking there? Right, right. No, it was very professional. And I feel like it was ran, it was ran through kind of just like a, a OTAs is in the NFL. Like it was real. I felt like it was real professional. Things were very organized and the practice schedule was organized and everything that we did just it kind of felt like it, it kind of felt very NFL like you know what I mean it's you know we have NFL coaching and everything like that so I I don't really see too much of a difference as far as like the organization and stuff like that of how the practices were ran that's great so mm -hmm. when it comes to the coaching staff what were they like what was um Jim Herman and your defensive coach Chris Dishman I believe that's how right. you say his name Right. How what were they like? Were they kind of more serious? Was it more of a laid back kind of feeling at OTAs? Uh, I mean, they're definitely serious. You know, everyone is you know kind of looking at this league as like another chance to show what you have. I mean, even even the coaches, you know, so everyone's taking it very serious. You know, the coaches, you know, they're teaching us the playbook, making sure everyone's ready for training camp. 
so that everything will be smooth and we're not really stressing about the playbooks. We can just go out there and play fast. Coach, coach Herman, he's a he's a good he's a very good coach. You know, high intensity guy. Uh, wants everybody flying to the ball, and you know, Coach Dishman, uh, another another great coach. He brought in a great great group of DBs. I feel like, and it's very it's a very very competitive room, and I feel like during this training camp, a lot of people are gonna be able to show what they can do and separate themselves. And I feel like it's gonna be a great season this year. That's awesome. That's awesome. So when it comes to that defense, what do you think it's going to look like maybe scheme wise or talent wise? Cause I've been trying to find mm-hmm. stuff on Jim Herman. I really only found his stuff from his Michigan days, but recently, what do you think it's going to look like scheme wise? Anything like Gary Patterson or anything like that? Um, it's, it's not, I mean, it's, everybody has, you know, your, your sub packages and, you know, base stuff. Uh, when I was at TCU, we pretty much ran sub the entire game cause we ran that four, two, five. Yeah. But, um, Man, it's a lot of it's a lot of talent in the in the defensive room. I feel like a lot of guys with good experience. Uh, for the most part, everyone from, from everybody that I've talked to has pretty much uh, you know, decent amount of NFL experience and know what is what it, they know what it's like to be on that level. So I feel like a lot of guys are going to be going out here during training camp and just trying to show what they can do and show that they can still play. Absolutely. So. What are you most excited about for this XFL season? I'm just kind of I'm excited just to have more spring football and different things right. like that because I love watching football. Right. But what are you excited other than like the opportunity it brings? Is there any new rules you're excited for, or just the ex- the excitement about being on the field again? Man, really just being out there on the field again. Anytime you know you can keep playing the game of football after college, man, I just feel like it's a blessing. And this league is definitely going to open a lot of doors for every, you know, everyone that's participating in this league, players, coaches, st- you know, just staff members. Like, it's just really a great opportunity. It's coming up at the right, the right time for a lot of people. And I just, I, I feel like so far everything seems like it's professional and it's run, it's running pretty smooth. Uh, you, you know, we got training camp coming up in a few days and, you know, I'm definitely looking forward to it. Absolutely, man. So, I know the rule book is coming out soon. Is there any insight you have to any of the rule changes that are going to make it a lot different for like a cornerback? So anything from like speed of play um, or just covering I, receivers or anything like that? Well, I know that they've been preaching about how the game's going to be a little bit faster paced. Um, I'm kind of used to that because you know how the Big Twelve was and teams you know, oh, yeah. running their plays faster and stuff like that. So, but I mean, as far as like. Um, the defensive rules that it seems pretty similar to the to the NFL. I know that the receivers they only have to have one foot in. I believe that's about maybe the only difference. And then I know special teams is a little bit uh is a little bit different too. I think special teams is really the main difference with the league. Yeah. Hmm. So are you going to spend any time on like special teams, maybe returning kicks or anything? I know you did a little bit of that and at the beginning of your time at TCU, right. and then I'll bunch of that in high school so is there any chance you'll be doing that Um, with the guardians hey everybody sorry for the technical difficulties me and ranthony disconnected for a little bit and reconnected a couple minutes after we continued our conversation thank you for your patience sorry about that there was some technical difficulties here but i'm back with ranthony tejada again um i do not remember what we were talking about i think (laughs) do you remember it all i think we were talking about Special, uh, we were talking about new rules of the game or something. Oh, yeah. And I asked you if, like, you were planning on doing any special teams yeah. with the Guardians or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just, I was just saying, um, I'm, I'm not sure as far as like the returns and stuff because they were shuffling a lot of guys in and out with that. But I'm definitely on a few special teams. And, you know, that's, that's important too, as it is on every, every professional team. Oh, yeah. So, I know you had some fun probably with mini camp and everything. So I'm just going to ask you like a couple questions about the teammates and stuff like that. And just okay. a couple of different things like that real quick. When it comes to receivers, who is the biggest trash talker amongst the receivers? The biggest trash talker, man. Uh, I mean, the guys weren't really talking too much trash, but I would probably say, yeah. um, probably, uh, Damon Giuseppe. He, oh he, yeah. 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 He talks a little bit. <laughs> but for the He's most be part, fun to watch. yeah. But for the most part, guys was just trying to make sure they running the right routes and running the right plays and stuff like that, and getting lined up. So makes sense. Mini camps a lot of just learning the playbook, right. mostly, I guess. Right, right. Yeah. 
So, um, who's the funniest guy amongst the defensive backs? Man, uh, I would have to say Nadir. He is Nadir. he is hilarious. Yeah, Philly guy. <laughs> he's definitely he's definitely one of the funniest guys that I've met so far. He's gonna be fun to watch too. He's a little bit bigger guy. Yeah, out there at corner. Yeah, he's a funny guy for sure. Out of the, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. Mm-hmm. Um, just a random question. What's your favorite coverage to run as a defensive back? I know you ran a lot of different things. Like Gary Patterson, he's kind of right a little bit renowned in the coaching world for what he does on the defensive side of the ball. So, what was your favorite coverage to run while you're at TCU with the Redskins or even in the CFO? Um, man, that's that's tough. I mean, for the most part, man, I'm my favorite coverage, of course, is just man. Like I like just going one on one. It's easy. You don't have to think much. Um, yeah. <laughs> all the other stuff, all the other stuff is fun. But just being able to know that you got this man one on one, and it's on you to stop him. You know what I mean? That's always just been something that I, I enjoy competing. Oh yeah, I get that. When I was mm-hmm. back when I was playing a little college ball at the D three level, so it's nothing yeah. like what you guys did at TCU. But mine, I played a little safety, and I my favorite was cover two, yeah. just because I was over the top, kind of right. over everything. Right. Right. So, right. Exactly. But at corner, it's totally different. Every time yeah. I ask a corner, they're always like, yeah, I love man. <laughs> yo, yo, you get to compete, man. That's that's what it's about. Oh, yeah. So when it comes to, um, I guess, the rest of your defense, who do you think is, who's the biggest guy on the defense? Like just size-wise, maybe personality-wise? Man, on the defense, I, I mean, of course, on the D-line, like, um, we got some pretty big dudes on the D line. I feel like, uh, I wouldn't say I, I feel like they're all like around the same size. So I wouldn't just say one guy sticks yeah. out. But man, I, I feel like size wise, like we 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 got a pretty big team. I feel like all yeah. around, all around. To be honest, every position mm-hmm. we got pretty you know pretty good size. So I don't think size thing will be something where people saying we're not a, a big team or anything like that. Yeah. So, um, are you much of a trash talker yourself, or do you more let your talk, your play talk a little bit like Man, that? Man, I kind of let my play do the talking. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not much. Of just, <laughs> I'm not much of a raw raw guy. I kind of just like try to just get my job done, stuff like that, make plays. Yeah, no, I get that. So, mm-hmm. when it comes to the XFL this season, who got? Who do you think you guys are most excited to play? Um, I I know for me personally, it'll be fun to come back to Dallas and play the Dallas team. I know, I know that'll be something that I'll be looking forward to because you know I'll be able to have family and stuff come to the game, yeah, games and stuff like that. So, uh, that's probably the game that I'll be looking forward to. Yeah, that makes sense. I used to um live in Texas myself a little bit mm-hmm. back in back when I was younger, like middle school days, because my parents right. were military. I lived in Colleen, Texas, right in the okay. middle. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No way Some of them out there loved it down there. Is that where you're at right now? I know you went to high school in Texas and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm in the Fort Worth area right now. Fort Worth, yeah. Mm-hmm. So when it comes to uniforms, who do you? Th- which team do you think has the best uniforms? Man, I think we got the best uniforms for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm really feeling our uniforms: the black, the the gray, the red. Like it looks, it looks pretty sweet. I, know. I like the gray ones myself. The gray away ones. Yeah, those are my favorite. You can't go wrong with those uniforms. No, I like them a lot. Even our practice, even like our practice uniforms are pretty dope. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. So when it comes to like of the other teams, though, other than the Guardians, who has your favorite uniform? Um, I, I really like the um the DC. I like the red. I like the red and white. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Dallas has some pretty, pr- pretty cool colors. The the baby blue or whatever it is. It's, yeah. I think that's pretty dope, too. So probably them, too. I like those. That makes I like sense. those two I, uniforms. Too. I like those ones too a lot. The, the mm. Defenders one, right when I saw it the first time, it kind of just popped off the screen a little right, bit. With right, that yeah, just it stands sleek out. red look. Yeah, it stands out. You know? So when it comes to this offense that we're going to have that's run by Kevin Gilbride, what's your kind of first impressions of like guys like Matt McGloin and D'Angelo Yancey and guys like them? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I feel like they're going to do pretty well. You know, we'll definitely get to see what it's really about during training camp when they get to go yeah. against you know, other teams and stuff like that. But, you know, it definitely looks like, you know, like a pro style offense and, you know, they're going to try to just move the ball down the field pretty well. And, you know, we'll, we'll get to see more once training camp comes, you know, mini camp, everyone's kind of shuffling around and some days you have all your parts. Some days you don't have all your parts. Mm -hmm. So definitely training camp will 
let guys, you know, show what they're really about. Absolutely. Training camp's in Houston this year, isn't it? Yeah, that's in Houston. Yep. Yes. But you're pretty happy about that. It's kind of staying closer to home. Yeah, yeah. It's not, it's, I mean, it's kind of far, but it's not too far. So yeah, I'll still no. be in Texas. Can't, can't beat that. Yeah, no, it's a little better than New York, especially yeah, this time right. of year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Love it. Yeah. All right, man. Well, that's all I got for you today. Um, okay. I appreciate you coming on. I appreciate talking to you. Is there any way people can follow you on social media or st- um, stay in touch with you at all? Oh, yeah, for sure. So Twitter, my Twitter at name is at R Tejada, my last name. So R-T-E-X-A-D-A. And then my Instagram is at Issa, I-S-S-A underscore rant, R-A-N-T, bro, B-R-O. That's my Instagram. All right. And so people can just follow me on there. That's where they can get in touch with me. Absolutely, man. I know I'm excited to see you play. I know a bunch of Guardians fans are just excited to see the Guardians play as well. Super excited for you and the opportunity you get. Loved watching your film. Loved watching you play. So I just can't wait to see what happens. Appreciate you coming on. No problem, man. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, guys, we made it to the end. After a long and arduous process of losing everything I recorded and re-recording it, I want to thank Gavin Hayes and Ranthi Tejada for coming on and talking to me. It was a pleasure talking to them. Make sure you check out xflboard.com and read their articles. Follow Gavin Hayes on Twitter. Follow Ranthi Tejada on Twitter and Instagram. Make sure the Guardians know that he's welcome on the team and welcomed by this fan base. And last, make sure you follow TGP Podcast on Twitter. It's going to be at TGP underscore podcast email me at the guard post podcast at gmail.com if you have any questions or any suggestions thank you guys for listening stay on duty guardians fans